So yesterday, I talked about two-dimensional uh, yarn mills. This time, I'm going to four dimensions, as planned. So let me first review very quickly the Lagrangian of 4DN equals 2 gauge theories. Um, I'm, I, I'm assuming that you are familiar with n equals 1 superfields notation with n equals 1 supersymmetry. So with n equals 2 supersymmetry, there are basically two types of multiplets. One is the vector multiplet in n equals 2 supersymmetry, and there's a hypermultiplet. So in n equals 1 notation, vector multiplet contains n equals 1 vector multiplet, which we usually denote by W alpha, and uh, chiral superfield phi, both are in the adjoint. And of course, the chiral superfield contains the scalar component and fermion component. So vector superfield contains gauge genome and uh, gauge field strength. What happens in this combination is that there is a SU2 R symmetry. which mixes uh, these two n equals one multiplet. Um, in a superconformal case, there is also a U1, U1R symmetry. And it is, con well, the gauge field cannot have any U1R charge. Then due to the charge of the supercharge, this will have R charge one, and this will have U1R charge two. So this is the vector multiplet. So this is some ga G gauge field. Now suppose you, you want to add some matter content. In that case, you want to introduce something called hypermultiplet. So in n equals one language, that consists of a chiral superfield in some representation R of G, and another chiral superfield, Q twiddle, which is in the conjugate representation of the Q fields. And uh, this Q will contain scalar component Q and the fermion component Psi alpha. And in order to exhibit n equals two supersymmetry, it's useful to consider the conjugate of this Q twiddle field so that this Q twiddle dagger is also transforming in this representation R. And that will contain the dotted spinner field and the complex conjugate of the <laughs> To lowest component of this Q twiddle. Now, what happens is that again, this middle component becomes a SU to R doublet. And in this, in this case, the U1R charge assignment is zero, minus one, and one. So this is the hi uh, hypermultiplet. And in the Applications I'm going to describe, uh, it is important to also consider something called half hypermultiplet. So this is possible when R is pseudo real. So for those of you who are not familiar with this terminology, um, our representation R is called real. If its complex conjugate representation is the same as I mean, isomorphic to the original representation, but there are in fact two types. So the two types uh, is distinguished by the type of uh, invariant tensor. So if, that, if R is a real representation, then it should have a either a symmetric invariant tensor or an anti-symmetric invariant tensor. If it has a symmetric invariant tensor, this is called strictly real. 
And if it has an anti-symmetric invariant tensor, it is called pseudo-real. So the most familiar one for you would be, if you take gauge group to be SU2, three would be real representation because delta ij is symmetric, but the doublet representation is a pseudo-real representation because epsilon ij, which is the invariant tensor, is an anti-symmetric one. So half hypermultiplet is only possible when R is pseudo-real, and uh, this is obtained by imposing a constraint. Impose uh, Q twiddle A equal JAB QB. So this is the constraint you impose. So this cuts the number of fields in half. That's why it's called half hypermultiplet. And the reason why you cannot do this with strictly real representation is that in order to keep this SU to R symmetry, you need to choose anti-symmetric tensor here. So that, that's what it is. So those are the multiplets. Let's now discuss the Lagrangian. So again, I'm going to use n equals one superfield notation. Pardon? You cannot have strictly real half hypers. Half hyper is only possible for pseudo real representation. Um, so the Lagrangian has the vector multiplet part. So you have a standard kinetic term. For the adjoint superfields there, plus the gauge kinetic term, sorry, I forgot trace, plus complex conjugate. So this is the Lagrangian for the vector multiplet. And you would have a kinetic term for the Q fields. Q twiddle dagger, and certain very important coupling, d squared theta, Q twiddle phi Q, plus complex conjugate. So very simple. Important thing is that because with n equals two supersymmetry, uh, gauge field and this phi field are in the same multiplet. Therefore, the coefficient here and coefficient there uh, is related by supersymmetry. Maybe I should say that this tau is a certain combination of the gauge coupling constant and the theta parameter. And similarly, uh, oops. Similarly, um, this is a standard n equals one coupling of the Q fields and the vector multiplet, right? But the vector multiplet in n equals two not only contains this V, but also phi. Therefore, by applying n equals two part of the supersymmetry, you obtain this coupling of Q and Q twiddle with phi starting from this kinetic term. So that's, so you see that uh, this part is a um, super partner of this gauge matter matter coupling. So again, the coefficient here and coefficient there is related by supersymmetry and the ratio is fixed. Ah, so I'm sloppy about the precise coefficients, but you can find them in the literature. And uh, in, in any case, the precise coefficients are not important in my lectures this time. So this is Lagrangian. So let's discuss the renormalization. So of course in a gauge theory, there's a running of this coupling, right? And the one loop beta function is proportional 
It's very easy to compute, as you know. You just count the number of multiplets, multiply by a gauge uh, representation factor. So this has the following form. So there's a contribution from the vector multiplet. And there will be a contribution from the hyper multiplet. Sorry, plus ri bar. Well, let me I give you the notation. So this t, t of r is a, basically a quadratic Casimir given by T A T B in the representation R is given by delta A B T of R. And uh, in any case, we only use the, I, I only have time to discuss G equals S U N. In that case, T of a joint is N and T of fundamental is one half. And uh, this is the contribution from the vector multiplet. And this is a contribution from the hyper multiplet. And this is the contribution from the Q field. This is the contribution from the Q twiddle field. In the case of half hyper multiplet, you need to drop one. So that's why it's useful to split this. I mean, representation theory guarantees that this and that is equal, but uh, this is what it is. So you immediately see that when R is G, it's zero because this is twice T adjoint, T adjoint, so it's zero, it's zero. So this is the N equals four super Mills case. So this is a very important fact that the n equals 4 super m, that's at 0 p, 1 loop beta function. And another example is the one uh, I referred to yesterday. So we, if you have S u n as g and uh, two nf copies of fundamental hyper multiplet, so it contains q field in the fundamental, and uh, maybe you cannot read it, so uh, sorry. Let me continue here. So another example is to take G to be SUN and you take two NF pairs of half fiber multiplet fundamental plus fundamental. So NF equals two N C of fundamentals plus anti-fundamental. So this gives you two N for, for the first term, right? And fundamental plus fun, anti-fundamental gives you two, one half plus one half, which is one. So in order to cancel two N, you need to have two N copies of it. So this, again, this has zero, zero one loop bit. Here comes a very important fact about, a simplifying fact about n equals two supersymmetric systems. So this is very important fact. Uh, with n equals two, Suzy, uh, if one loop beta is zero, then it's zero to all order. and even non-perturbatively. So this guarantees, this fact guarantees that just by checking this group theoretical fact, uh, this system has a UV uh, coupling constant that that's tunable. So let's just quickly show how this fact can be derived. I'm not going to into detail, but uh, the rough idea is as follows. So let's use uh, Zyberg's holomorphic trick so there is a certain renormalization scheme in n equals one supersymmetry where uh, holomorphy of the chiral superfields are preserved. So, so let's assume that. In that case, uh, two base, there are two basic facts. One is that the superpotential term is not renormalized. The second con condition is that 
the gauge coupling constant is only running at one loop. I guess I should write it. So So tau runs only at one loop. And uh, super potential doesn't run. So this is a generic n equals one fact that can be learned in any uh, modern textbook on supersymmetry. So this is a super potential term. So this coefficient one doesn't run. And this coefficient tau only runs at one loop. But we are now assuming that there's no one loop running of tau. So this doesn't run either. In a generic n equals one system, there will be some uh, wave function renormalization factor, z phi and z q, that are the sources of many interesting dynamics of n equals one supersymmetric systems. But here we are talking about n equals two supersymmetric systems. And as I already told you, the ratio of the coefficient here and the coefficient there is fixed by n equals two supersymmetry. Therefore, uh, if this doesn't run, this needs to stay at one. Similarly, if this part doesn't run, because of the n equals to supersymmetry, this cannot be non-trivial. Done. So this is the all order, at least qualitative all order proof of this fact. So now, so this, these are the examples what I referred to at the beginning of my first lecture yesterday. So there is a gauge theory in four dimensions where you can tune the gauge coupling at UV. That can be very weak, but you can choose it to be very strong. So you would like to ask what happens if you tune uh, the gauge coupling very, very uh, strong. So let's concentrate on the particular case of n equals two with SU2 and NF equals four. So uh, in this case, let me just remind you what I told you yesterday. So there are two pairs of quarks in the doublet, but there are four of them. However, as is familiar, uh, doublet and anti-doublet of SA2 are the same. So instead of writing them as this, let's use the notation that, that we have QA1 and 2, and I goes from 1 to 8. In this notation, uh, this superpotential term has this particular coupling, AQB, AB, and this is a, if you take a symmetric combination of the doublet indices, you get the adjoint index of SU2, right? And you have I, J, delta IJ. So this is the superpotential term there. So this means that this system has SO8 uh, flavor symmetry. So, uh, if you work out the scalar potential from the Lagrangian I just erased, I'm sorry about that, uh, there is a scalar potential. And uh, it's a standard exercise to see that there's a term of the form trace of phi, phi dagger squared, plus various terms in involving Qs. So from this you easily see that if phi is of this form, a minus a, zero, zero, and if you set both q and q twiddle to be zero, now this is a, is a 
zero energy vacua, and that guarantees supersymmetry. So it, it, these are supersymmetric vacua. When A is non-zero, uh, this is a VEV, non-zero VEV in the triplet of SU2. Therefore, this breaks SU2 to U1, right? And this is a very classic case uh, studied by many people in the past. So uh, first of all, this is a Higgs there is a Higgs mechanism going on. So there will be tons of massive excitations. So uh, some fields become massive. Now massive. So I mean some comp some component of the phi will have m phi is given by basically 2 a, let's say a, absolute value, and some fields, some components of q will have mass of the form 1 half q a. So these are different by a factor of 2 because of the difference in the charge of uh, phi and q. But not only that, when the gauge group SU2 is broken to U1, there is Tohoft Polyakov monopole. And uh, what's the mass of that? What's the mass of that? Uh, in any case, the original theory is doesn't have any mass scale. The only thing which is introducing the mass scale is this A. Therefore, this should be proportional to A. But monopole is a classical configuration, semi-classical configuration, and the energy can be read off from the Lagrangian. And there was a Lagrangian written here, which I erased, but there's an overall fact of one over G squared. So typically you have uh, something of this form. And uh, in fact, you can find the exact formula, uh, which just becomes this, tau A absolute value. So when tau is, I mean, when G, coupling constant is very weak, of course, one over G is extremely large, which means that this monopole is extremely heavier than these perturbative excitations. So of course this is important to remember this is perturbative. But these are really quanta, quanta of the original QFT, perturbative quanta. And this is semi-classical soliton. So what would happen if you crank up the gauge coupling? So when G is of order one, eventually this will become lighter and lighter, eventually the mass would become comparable. But if you go further and make the coupling constant even larger, what would happen is that eventually the solitonic object would be lighter than the perturbative excitation themselves. So, well, in that regime, I shouldn't really call something as a soliton and something as a perturbative excitation because it's very quantum mechanical, but uh, we can expect that. So the statement of S duality in this case is that uh, when tau, sorry, when G is very big, Um, there is another weakly coupled frame where Q quanta and monopole 
are exchanged. So in the original description, this is A and this is tau A, one half. And in the, in the dual description, uh, Q quanta, a dual Q quanta, and a dual monopole would have mass A dual and a tau dual A dual, sorry, I'm tau dual A dual, but they are they can be exchanged if uh, so if the ratio if tau d over two is sorry two two d one over two tau and if you rescale A, D, and A. So this is the uh, basic property of S-duality. This exchanges perturbative excitation and monopole. You might ask, how can it be possible? I mean, I just told you that there are eight Eight fields here, right? In SO8 representation. Very naively speaking, uh, very classically, if you are given a system where SU2 is broken to U1, there's just one monopole configuration. So how can you map eight fields here and just one monopole? So, pardon? Yes. Ah, um, so this needs to be equal to that. So you just solve uh, one of, uh, I think the, the equality here is easier to solve. So tau A should be 2AD. This means that uh, AD is 2 tau A. Yeah, sorry for putting additional 2 here. For n equals 4 super m, this 2 doesn't appear. Thank you for the question. So, monopole, there are in fact, I mean, eight monopole states. Here it is important to perform treat monopole quantum mechanically. So what happens is that in the monopole configuration, uh, there's a non-trivial uh, profile of the gauge field and phi. And then you need to consider Q field in this non-trivial background. Sorry, I should have used I. In particular, this contains a fermion component, and this has zero modes, fermionic zero modes, which I denote as C of I from one to eight. So what happens is that if you treat the monopole quantum mechanically, there should be an action of these fermionic operators. If you work out the quantization problem of these fermionic zero modes carefully, you find that CI, CJ satisfy this standard anti-commutation relation. 
So this is exactly the same as the gamma matrix uh, identities, right? This means that the monopole states So this means that monopole states are in the spinner representation of SO8 flavor symmetry. So there are two spinner representations, HS and HC. And if you work more carefully, you can check that one half of this spinner component has, is not just a monopole, but becomes a dion. So this becomes a dion. And this part becomes a pure monopole. But in any case, we find eight monopole fields. Again, so there are eight fields after quantization. But remember, uh, sorry, we, what we did is the quantization here, the eight fields. So originally, Q fields were in the vector representation of the SO8 symmetry, and the monopole is in the 8S of the SO8 symmetry. But if you want to do this identification, what happens is that this dual Q quanta, dual Q quanta should be in not the vector representation of SO8, but should be in the spinner representation of SO8. So in this S duality, both sides are SU2 gauge theory with four flavors, and they look very, very similar. But you need to remember that the SO8 flavor symmetry representation assignment is different from between this side and the other side. Right. Ah. Um, so the reason is that the C field came from this Q field, right? And Q field is charged under the U1, which is unbroken subgroup of SU2, which means that C field, I mean, the C operator also have charge plus minus one. Therefore, if you act on a monopole state by one C, it adds an electric charge. And as you know, gamma matrices, if act on a wild spinner, that gives you a different wild spinner. So if you act by C field once, you get on this side. If you act by another C field, you get on back on this side. Therefore, the electric charge of this monopole state and the other monopole state are different by one unit. So that's how you see that these should be dions. Yep. That's a very good question. So <laughs> you can work out similarly how monopoles transform under the flavor symmetry, but you immediately learn that it is not very easy to do this kind of uh, identification. So this nice way of mapping things only work with SU2. And the SU3 case was only understood in 2007. So this was pro uh, proposed by Zyberg Witten in 94. So it took 20 years or something. No, 10 years? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know that in SO8 there is also a dimensional representation of this vector. Right? right. So then you have this reality that. That's right. So how do you act in this computation? What is the. I'm skipping over the details. Uh, 
So this monopole with this charge it has mass of the form tau A, and the monopole of this other guy has the mass of the form tau plus one A. So what happens is that if the gauge coupling is very big with theta angle zero, uh, this guy becomes massless. But if you keep gauge coupling to be, th sorry, theta angle to be pi, and make gauge coupling strong, this guy becomes massless instead. That's how you get to a point where the light degrees of freedom transforms in A to C. So that's how the triality works. So there are three points which are special in the space of complexified tau. So that's how the triality works. Right. Yeah, right. So that, that's why th this was originally called triality. Um, so where should I write? So how should I say? Uh, I don't have time to discuss the details, but uh, states in the system can be characterized by the electric charge and magnetic charge, right? And basically, what you find is that odd even combination, if charge is odd and monopole charge is even, this transforms in 8V. Well, I mean, one eight-dimensional representation and if you consider even electric charge and odd monopole charge thing, this transforms in the 8S. And uh, if you trans consider odd, odd combination, this transforms in the 8C. So th they are in a completely uh, symmetric com combination because, but because by S duality you can exchange E and M, and by T transformation you can mix E and M. So in that way you can freely mix uh, three types of eight-dimensional representation. Even, even. So even, even, uh, typically they are in the adjoint representation. Yeah. So this is the, what, what's going on in SU2 with four flavors. But this is, but the arguments I provided so far are very crude, right? We just studied the flavor symmetry content of the excitations in one weakly coupled frame and boldly claim that this should be mapped. So how can we check this more precisely? So in the original paper in 94, Zyberg and Witten computed something called the zyberg witten curve of this system and checked this triality. That's a fun exercise, uh, but uh, it's rather complicated, so let's do something else. So for, for this, I introduced the concept of the superconformal index. So the superconformal index I define for 4D, n equals to uh, superconformal theory. So these theories are examples of this superconformal theory. And you put, put this system on S3 times R. Well, this R should be straight, but sorry. <laughs> um, so you can start from the flat space and perform a vial transformation and conformal transformation to get there. And so let, let's give a name, so this is T. And very roughly speaking, superconformal index of this theory T is just a Witten index 
uh, of this system on S3. So you consider Hilbert space on S3. And you pick a supercharge. Pick a supercharge Q. Cap Q. And as always, you put the anti-commutator of QQ dagger here. And you add, you can add some additional objects here. Objects commuting with Q and Q dagger. Sorry for using the same symbol Q for the hypermultiplets and the supercharge, but unfortunately alphabets have so many letters, we cannot help. So from the standard argument about width and index, uh, this is independent of beta, first of all. Also independent of deformations of the theory. of the theory preserving uh, this supercharge Q and Q dagger. So it's a very nice object. So if this S duality is really true, we should be able to compute the superconformal index on one weakly coupled frame and do the same thing on the dual weakly coupled frame where the original gauge coupling is extremely strongly coupled and we should be able to compare the superconformal indices which should agree because it should be invariant under the deformation of the gauge coupling constant. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, but first of all, I need to give you a more explicit form of this expression and the equations I'm going to write would become more and more horrible as the time goes on. So please bear with me for a few seconds, few, uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, but there's something amazing thing going on in this superconformal index business. So what we need to do is to pick particular Q so in n equals two superconformal algebra, uh, we know that there's SU to R symmetry, right? So Q has this SU to R index and also the spinner index. Spinner of SO4 rotating S3 and also there's a conjugate ones. I mean, in the conjugate spinner, dotted spinner ones. So pick, let's pick our Q, our Q in the superconformal index to be Q1 uh, minus dot, I mean, one, one of this guy. It doesn't really matter, everything is equivalent, but it helps to pick just one. So, uh, so I'm following Rastedi et al's convention of using plus dot and minus dot here. Then, then QQ dagger can be computed and this becomes delta minus 2J2 minus 2I3 plus this. So this J2, I mean J, J1, J2 are the spins of SO4. Our delta is the scaling dimension or the energy on S3. And uh, I3 is the Cartan of SU2. And R is the U1R charge. U1R charge. Yeah, it's very... Right. 
then what can be put there? So the thing we can put there depends on lots of parameters. So there are three things we call P, Q, and T, and something called X, I, and that is trace three, F, Q, Q dagger, and uh, P to J2 plus J1 minus, oh no, and Q, J2 minus J1 minus 2R, and T, I3 minus 2R. So these are the combination of that super conformal charges. And finally, you have insertions of uh, something like this. So FIs are the generators. of Kartan of uh, flavor symmetry. So this is a horrible expression. Horrible, horrible expression. But it's very explicit, right? So take a free hypermultiplet of U1 charge what plus minus one. So phi so there's a phi psi and uh, phi twiddle and psi twiddle. So this has charge plus one and this has charge minus one, right? In this case, this is a free theory. Therefore, the Hilbert space on S3 can be computed very explicitly. It's just a Fox space. So in your first lecture of QFT, when you enter graduate school, you learned how to do the free field quantization on flat R3. There you expanded the field in the Fourier modes. Instead here, you expand the modes of phi and psi in terms of a spherical harmonics on S3. It's exactly the same computation conceptually. You can work out this very explicitly. Uh, I was thinking of doing the computation, but I don't have time. So let me just say the resulting SCI. SCI free hyper of P, Q, T, and X is given by the product of two special functions, gamma PQ, T1 half X, gamma PQ, uh, T1 half X inverse, where gamma PQ of Z is an infinite product of uh, two sets of positive, sorry, non-negative integers such that uh, P M plus one, Q N plus one, and uh, one minus Z P M Q N. So one of the first amazing thing is that somehow mathematicians long time ago came up with this stupid product of tons of factors for their own reasons. But it exactly fits the super conformal index of this free field. I have no idea why mathematicians came up with this, but somehow using this mysterious special function, which is just an infinite product because it's just a Fox space, a free field contribution is just product of two gamma functions. So this is called elliptic gamma function. So this is something strange. So the next thing, so free fields are okay. How, how to compute SCI of a gauge theory?
Pardon? Yeah. Ah, so these are just choices. Um, you see, superconform algebra is also Lie algebra. Therefore, you have a number of Cartan generators. And what I just erased, delta J1, J2, I3, R, are the generators of the Cartan of the superconform algebra. I just took all the possible linear combinations that commute with Q and Q dagger. So the invariant information is that there are just three linear combinations that commute with Q and Q dagger. And it's just your choice of using P and Q and T here. So in fact, uh, when Rastelli et al. first start working this out, they tried various different symbols by doing linear combinations. After two years, they realized that they should have used this particular basis. With that choice, somehow, this relation to the mathematics is <laughs> very clear. But, uh, so that, that's a, just a convenient choice to compare with the math literature. So SCI over gauge theory uh, can be computed. Yeah. Yes. Uh, U1R symmetry, symmetry. Uh, U1R symmetry will be anomalous for the gauge theory with non zero beta function. But for zero beta function case, U1R symmetry is guaranteed to be there. Yes. So <laughs> I guess I don't have time to <laughs> really check. There's a computation, but uh, uh, so, so the idea is to do the computation. Yeah. Study HS3 in a weakly coupled limit, uh, keeping thinking the gauge group. as the flavor symmetry and then impose gauge invariance. So when you learn Uh, quantization of gauge theory, you learn that you need to introduce ghosts, and, it, and in the intermediate step, you have tons of un unphysical modes in the Hilbert space, which then cut down by the BRST operator. So you just do that. So in a particular case of SU2 gauge theory, let me just skip over the uh, general discussion. So in the case of gauge theory, you pick a Cartan element of SU2 and think of this as a external flavor symmetry variable like this. Then SCI of the gauge theory is given by uh, multiplying a vector multiplet contribution gamma pqt, gamma pq1, and uh, product of plus minus, gamma pq tz plus minus, gamma uh, pq. Z plus or minus two, one over. So I don't have time to explain, but this is just, this is the contribution from the Fox space 
of the vector multiplet plus ghosts, right? And you multiply the hyper contribution. And you need to do this projection down to the gauge invariant part. That is, in the case of SU2, just given by a residue integral. So you see there are three factors here. Three factors. One fa this is because SU2 is three-dimensional. This is the contribution from the Kaltan. Plus comes from the uh, highest weight vector, and the minus comes from the lowest weight vector. So this is the expression. So let's consider. So let's consider the case of. Let's explicitly work out ISU two with n f equals four, right? So we need to write down this hyper contribution. I already gave this general expression for the hyper contribution, so it's doable, but. Let's introduce the trick of Gaiotto. So hyper, hypers, we have been using uh, this expression so far. One, two for the gauge index, and eight, flavor index. Let's consider it as n equals, nf equals two plus nf equals two. Then this becomes QA, 1, 2, and I from 1 to 4, and another Q, 1, 2, and this time J is from 1 to 4. So there's this SO4 symmetry acting here, another SO4 symmetry acting here. So what, what we did is just to add artificially reduce the flavor symmetry from SO8 to SO4 times SO4, right? And yeah, I wanted to keep this, but I couldn't. And this can be further decomposed into SU2A times SU2A, B, uh, from the first one, and to SU2C times SU2D, oops, for the second one. So what happens is that uh, 8V, we have been talking about, becomes, of course, 4 of this and 4 of this SO4. And you know the decomposition under this. So this becomes, 8V becomes 2A, times tensor 2B plus 2, uh, 2C times 2D. And because we have this gauge index, you also have 2 gauge. And this is times 2 gauge. So from this expression, we see that this matter content is transforming under 2A times 2B times 2G. Very symmetric. So this is called tri-fundamental. And there's another tri-fundamental. So the good thing is that the 8S decompose under it as 2A times 2D plus 2B times 2C, for example. And you need to multiply by dual gauge symmetry. So this is the situation. So the original uh, SU2 with four flavor duality can be drawn in this way. So in the first setup, you have tri-fundamental ABG another tri-fundamental GCD. So this is the original setup. 
SU2 with two flavors and two flavors. In total, there are four flavors. And the dual frame, you have tri-fundamental in ADG prime and another tri-fundamental in uh, BCG. So this is a very nice diagrammatic way of encoding the change from 8V to 8C. This way, you can write down this hyper contribution nicely. So let me do that. So, tri fundamental has three doublets. So we need to multiply tons of gamma PQ. Gamma PQ and uh, gauge is Z, so T one half, Z plus minus, A plus minus, B plus minus. And finally, you need to multiply plus minus, plus minus, plus minus. Gamma PQ, T, uh, one, two, Z plus minus, C plus minus, D plus minus. So this is, the, this is it. This is the super conformal index of uh, SU2 with four flavors. The variables, so let's call this function I of PQT, semicolon AB, semicolon CD. So, a minus A, so A, A inverse is in SU2, A, etc. So from this construction, it is clearly clear that the final formula is symmetric under the exchange of A and B, right? Also, it is symmetric under the exchange of C and D. The question is whether you can replace D and B. So the question is, so if this duality is really true, we should have PQT, A, B, C, D should be equal to PQT, A, C, A, D, B, C, right? This is not at all obvious. How can you change B and D? So let's check that. So let's see if it works. Hopefully my computer is not dead. Come on. Ah, here it comes. Ta-da, can you read it? <laughs> so, um, here is this horrible function. This is just tons of infinite product. And I'm assuming that P, Q, T are all of the same order. And I want to do the formal series expansion in terms of T. So I just redefine P and Q to be uh, T times capital P and T times capital Q. Gamma P, Q is just an elliptic gamma function. I just translated, I mean, I just typed in uh, the gamma formula into mathematical this morning. And this is, well, gamma PQ1. And this is just a trick of not having to write the gamma PQ lots of lots of things. So, so this is a tri-fundamental contribution, this one, right? So I just wrote T to one half ABC, T to one half AB over C, T to one half AC over B, dot, dot, dot. So th there are eight terms. This is a vector multiplet contribution. This one, this guy, right? Uh, so this is the integration. So it's just a residue integral, very easy. And this is the final SCI, A, B, C, D. So let's just start from the lowest order computation, right? Uh, yeah, so this is the lowest order <laughs> computation, one plus blah, 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 blah. Is it symmetric under the exchange of B and, well, this time I said B and D. Yeah, so the difference is zero up to the order we specified. Let's go to the next order. And let's do the computation. Mm. Uh, of course it takes time. Uh, let's hope it ends uh, before 
Simon needs to start his talk. But uh, <laughs> uh, we should work. Ah, here it comes. So it's a horrible, horrible expression. Oh my god. <laughs> horrible, horrible, horrific expression. But you just take the difference. Ah, and it, it's beautiful, isn't it? So this is what Rastelli et al. did in the summer 2009. They did much more work to expand it into higher order. But he realized that there should be a better way. Because gamma PQ is a special function some mathematicians love. So Rastelli, Leonardo Rastelli told me an interesting story. He found a certain expert on this elliptic gamma functions. He emailed him asking whether he know, whether that math experts know the formula like this. The answer, the reply email was amazing. Apparently, a PhD student of that math expert had just completed the proof of exactly this equation, not just as a formal power series, but as a meromorphic function, and is, was writing up it as a thesis. How can that happen? I mean, <laughs> this was coming from, I mean, physics-motivated computation of the superconformal index, but somehow mathematicians with their own motivation came up with exactly the same combination of these tons of horrible elliptic gamma functions, and they are brave enough to really prove the equation. So I really don't know how that happened. Maybe human beings as a whole has some kind of collective consciousness. <laughs> so that uh, yeah, maybe we are just part of a, just like neurons in our head, right? I guess we don't, neurons inside my head don't know each other. But, so just like this, maybe there's a, <laughs> something going on in the, uh, on the earth trying to do something. Anyway, so this is the story I wanted to tell today. Thank you very much. Thanks.